A couple months ago, an image went viral across the internet. The pillars of creation. An image of interstellar gas and dust in the Eagle Nebula, taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. A testament to the power of today's science and technology, and a testament to the wonder and awe that still exists light years away from our Earth. And I looked at the picture, and probably for far longer than most would, and probably, for far, and probably to the point where it became rather obsessive. And so I began to ask myself a question that was very different from my fellow peers. Doesn't that image look like a piece of art? I mean, look at all the fluid colors, the vivid textures, and the story that the picture tells us. When you think about it, it's truly incredible. A scientific masterpiece has become intertwined in artistic splendor, a sort of cosmic Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. But the picture also proposed a dilemma for me because I've always been a scientist. At least that's what my parents tell me. <laughs> that's what my teachers have told me, my friends, my textbooks, my faculty, and even myself at one point or another. I am a student of the sciences, a student of chemistry, of biology, of physics, biochemistry, biophysical chemistry, and all the additional suffixes and prefixes you want to throw in between. And it's funny because I don't see myself as a scientist or even a student of science. Instead, I prefer to look at myself as an artist. That doesn't make any sense. Because how can somebody who studies the mysteries of an atom, the beauty of organic synthesis, and the poetic language of mathematics consider themselves to be an artist? That person has to be a scientist, or so they say. One of the first things people will tell you when you ask them to compare art and science, they'll say that there's no value in art. There are no answers. There are no truths. There's no security. Ultimately, there's nothing to find. Discoveries can only be made through science. But what is science? And so there are countless definitions of science and variations on those definitions, and even variations on those variations. And so I decided to make my own variation on the definition of science. Science is a cognitive process, a tool that humanity has used to propel itself forward in society through creativity, curiosity, innovation, and revolutionary thought. I want you to think about those four things. Creativity, curiosity, innovation, and revolutionary thought. Now, what about art? Similar to science, art has a plethora of definitions and variations on those definitions. And so here's my variation on the definition of art. Art is an intuitive process, a tool that humanity has used to propel itself forward in society through creativity, curiosity, innovation, and revolutionary thought. Something sounds rather familiar here. Now tell me that scientists are not artists, because it's true. All scientists are artists. And the scientific process is one that's embedded in artistry. Before I dive into the interplay that exists between art and science, I want to touch on both at a much more basic and simplistic level. Why do we bother even studying either art or science? What's the point? What drove Beethoven to continue writing symphonies he couldn't even hear? What drove Alan Turing his pursuit to crack a Nazi code? And so I want to propose two answers to this question. The first is curiosity. <laughs> Both scientists and artists are curious about what constitutes the universe that we inhabit. Scientists use this curiosity to unveil phenomena that we know today as the laws and systems that govern our reality. Many may think that artists aren't curious at all. I mean, what's so curious about painting a picture or writing a song? But many would be wrong. Because I believe that artists encompass and inhabit a curiosity that's very similar, if not more curious, than scientists do. The only major difference here is that artists possess a much more intuitive curiosity. Artists use their curiosity to guide their peaked interests, creating pieces that many are quick to dub as simply interpretations. That I believe are just as valuable as the interpretations that scientists make. And so the second reason we choose to study art and science 
his love of play. Both scientists and artists see their work simply as an extension of their childhood, a game that has been drawn out way past the maximum age. And though I don't personally find the solving of mathematical equations equating to an exhilarating Friday night, or spending near three years of my life writing a novel that may never be published or ever read, I know many artists and scientists who would love nothing more than to have those opportunities. And it's because of this interplay that exists between art and science, two very similar things when you think about why we pursue them, that our society can exist as what we know it as today. Steve Jobs once said that true innovation occurred at the crossroads of the humanities and the sciences. When you look at an image of da Vinci's iconic Vitruvian Man, one might say that it's a scientific masterpiece, a revolutionary work in human anatomy. But one might also say that's a wonderful piece of art, a powerful display of symmetry put on by one of humanity's greatest innovators. And one might also say, one being myself, that it's a work of both science and art. Why does there have to be a dichotomy when, the two, when these two pillars are so similar and so indistinguishable from one another? Without this calculated dance that exists between art and science, simple things such as that computer, that brain in your pocket, probably wouldn't even exist. And so that's all great, Jackie. When you think about it like that, art and science are kind of the same thing, but where's the practicality behind any of this? What's the point? Why is this an idea worth spreading? And so I thought about it. And I thought, and it, in the end, it really just came all back to me. And you're probably thinking, what a narcissist. But <laughs> <laughs> what's the point? Well, let's think about it like this. If art and science are inherently the same, can an education with a basis in both the arts and the sciences allow for one, if not both, to complement the other? And my answer to this question is yes, and it's a resounding yes, because there's evidence throughout history to prove that this is the case. I can only point to examples such as da Vinci, the legendary polymath, whose works transcend the strict definitions we put on art and science. In fact, da Vinci would often dig up corpses. Think about that. D dig up corpses. <laughs> to study their anatomy in order to better his skills in art. Hedy Lamarr, an actress from the 1940s who co-created a frequency hopping system in World War II. Ada Lovelace, the pioneer and mother of computer science, who doubled as an extravagant poet in the 18th century. But the most powerful and relatable example I can point to when discussing this art of science is Albert Einstein. And so Einstein is known today as arguably the most influential scientist and physicist of the 20th century. His works ultimately culminating in his name becoming synonymous with genius. And so people always talk about Einstein's incredible mind and his contributions to the scientific community. But people forget to ask the most important question for our society today. How did Einstein even think of all these things? How was he so creative? And so many will point to a combination of diligence and innate intellectual ability, a theory that is contradicted by Einstein's above average, but far from prodigal performance in early academia. And so being who I am, because this talk is entitled so, I like to believe that it was something outside of the realm of systematic logic and physics that allowed Einstein to generate such beautiful theories. Einstein was an avid violinist. In fact, his second wife once said that during the generation of his theories, if he was ever confused, he would often leave his study to play several chords on his piano, jot something down, and return to his study, open-minded and relaxed. He's been quoted to say, if I were not a physicist, I would probably be a musician. I often think in music. I live my daydreams in music. I see my life in terms of music. So the promotion of the imagination through music and ultimately art. Einstein was able to synthesize the realms of both art and science into a singular thought process, a sort of poetic math allowed him to revolutionize modern physics into what we know it as today. And so with this knowledge, why aren't there countless Einsteins <laughs> popping up in nations across the world? Why isn't science viewed as something that is fluid and creative anymore? 
So many factors come into play when you talk about this. Genetic factors, environmental influences, why people are going to school, how much they care about the material, their IQ. But I believe that there's a factor that trumps all these. And it boils down to the way science is being taught. Your modern scientific education system no longer promotes creativity. Rather, it promotes memorization of facts and regurgitation of these facts. And I use the term facts very lightly because to me, just like art, science is simply an interpretation. And it just so happens to be the interpretation that fits the best at this present moment. Your modern scientific education system teaches math in the absence of music, science in the absence of art, and imparts knowledge at the expense of the imagination. And so a study done in 2012 by the University of Kansas looked at 6,006 students over four years, comparing students who were participating in music programs versus those who weren't measuring for their academic performance. And so what the study found was that the students who were engaged in music programs outperformed their peers who weren't on every academic indicator. Grade point average, graduation rate, ACT scores, attendance, discipline referrals. And so what the study concluded was that the more a student participated in music and ultimately arts, the more positive these benefits in academic performance became. And so what we always talk about doing things for the coming generations. Think about the children, we say. And we tell these kids that education is like a river that will take them to new and uncharted lands we ourselves haven't had the opportunity to explore ourselves. But in our modern education system, that river's dammed, it's blocked off, and the coming generations are subsequently unable to even fathom what it's like on the other side. In order to truly reinvigorate our education system, the arts must influence the way we do science. The education system must recognize the value of arts as something more than a playful pastime, a hobby, and rather as a treasured form of knowledge. And only through this broadened breadth of wisdom can individuals and societies hope to rely on science as a tool anymore because we're lacking people who can ask the real questions. Because in a society and a system where everything is simply a fact, there are no questions to be asked. We have individuals with the capacity to alter the course of generations to come, developing minds ripe for innovation. And instead, we tell every student, every teacher, and every child that they need to focus on a speciality. I often get asked as a student, what's my major? Why does it matter? You don't need a speciality to tell you you're special. Why can't I major in ecology and accordion, or biology and beatboxing, or even piano and political science, of all things. So let's come back to this. There will be some of you who say art. That's perfectly fine. There will be some of you who say science. That's also perfectly fine. But maybe, and I'm praying here, maybe some of you will say it doesn't really matter because both science and art still inspire the same sense of wonder, the same sense of awe, and the same sense of imagination the world so desperately needs right now.